So uh, today uh, is Romans 5, 1 through 11. And let me, if, with any luck here, I've got a Bible somewhere. And let me, uh, let me go ahead and read that for us all. Romans 5, 1 through 11. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we exult in the hope of the glory of God. And not only this, but we must exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who is given to us. For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we must exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. That's another one of those passages from Paul that is just so jam-packed with ideas and stuff. So last week I went deep. This week I'm, I'm going to kind of go broad. And I think Paul raises at least nine different issues in 11 verses. So it's, it's going to kind of be a challenge, but I'm going to try to get everything in. But before we get started, uh, I, 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 I just I want to go back and review for us one more time. And the big picture is that uh, you know Romans 1 through 11 is theology. What is God? What is salvation? What is reconciliation? What is it? All those things theological principles that Paul is talking about. Can the law save me? Is there any value in the law? And sometimes all that theology can be boring. And Paul is going to do his best to, because remember, Romans is meant to be heard. And people uh, in the first century were used to listening to things. It was a very oral culture. So they would go to speeches just to hear somebody speak. And there were techniques that the speakers of the time used to hold their audience's attention. They would uh, anticipate objections, which Paul does. They would repeat themselves, which Paul does. They would interrupt themselves for a little interlude, kind of like a commercial today, to give everybody a chance to refresh their mind. And then they would remind people about going back to the, the main point, which is what Paul does today. So Paul is, is kind of pulling out all those stops to make this as, I don't want to say entertaining, but as listenable as possible and to hold his audience's attention. So 1 through 11 is theology. 12 through 15 is what do you do on the basis of that theology, right? So I, you know, if, if we kind of go back to where Paul started, it was with the problem in Romans 1 and 2, and it's everybody's a sinner, even the Jews, because the Jews thought you know, they were right with God because of the law, and Paul has to deal with that. Uh, Romans 3 is, is the solution. Of course, the solution is Jesus. That's what we talked about last week. And, you know, we, we talked about a, atonement and whether that's propitiation or expiation. And, and I don't really think it matters, personal opinion. But uh, it's Jesus did whatever he needed to do to make us right in every way with God. Now, if, if that's legal righteousness, it's, you know, imputed to us. I, whatever it needs to be done, Jesus has done it. So that's, that's kind of Paul's main point in all of Romans. But when he says something like that, there's, you know, the, the Jewish deacons in the back row go, well, what about the law, Paul? So he has to take a, a, anticipate that objection, take a break, deal with the law, and Abraham is his prime case because every good Jew would, would recognize that Abraham was declared as righteous. Now, the catch is that Abraham was declared as righteous before circumcision and before the law. So clearly, if Abraham is righteous before then, you can be righteous without circumcision and without the law. And that's what Paul is saying applies now, is that you are made righteous with God, made right with God, whatever that means, by faith through Jesus Christ and his atoning sacrifice. So that's, that's his big point. But then he's got to go back and say, sure, the law was good. And he's going to come back again about the problem of the Jews and Israel and the law because 
those deacons in the back row aren't convinced yet. They go, well, that may work for Abraham, but they still have an issue with Paul. So he's, he's trying to convince them. He's trying to uh, bring them around to his point of view, and we would say the correct point of view. So that brings us to chapter 5, where Paul is going to kind of sum up everything he's been doing. If you, 5 1 is one of those therefores. It's 5 1, 8 1, and 12 1 are the three big therefores in, in Romans, and it means a punchline is coming. So what Paul is saying is on the basis of all that stuff I talked about in the first four chapters, pay attention, y'all, here comes the punchline. And the punchline is we have peace with God. And now Paul, that's the main point, and Paul is going to kind of pick that apart as he goes through uh, the, the rest of chapter 5 and, and really up until Romans 11. Now, I think what Paul is doing is he is answering the big question that those Jewish deacons in the back row are going, well, Paul, so what? And this is a, a, something we still do today. I mean, and again, in the rhetoric of the time and in speech making of the time, it was important to answer that so what question. But it's important to us today as teachers, as preachers, as people who are trying to get someone to convince somebody of something. So I, when I went to Hewlett Packard, I did not want to be a sales rep. I did not go to be a sales rep. I had no interest in being a sales rep. But after I'd been with the company about nine months, they came to me and said, John, you're doing a great job, but that division you're working with is going away. Wouldn't you like to be a sales rep? And I said, no, not particularly. And they said, wouldn't you like to keep your job at Hewlett Packard? And I went, I would love to be a sales rep. <laughs> so they had to send me to sales training. I did not particularly want to go, did not particularly agree with a lot of stuff, but I learned it. And, and actually, surprisingly to me, it has been very, very valuable training because it turns out there is a lot of commonality between sales and teaching and preaching. I mean, they're all involved talking to an audience that may or may not want to be there, that, you know, maybe going, okay, it's 930, it's time to go to choir. Uh, that even if they are there, they may or may not care about what you're saying and yet you are still trying to motivate them to some kind of action. And that, that's what Paul is trying to do in Romans. That's what I do when I teach. And that's, that's kind of what's happening here. Because I'm going to give you all what I think you ought to do when we get done. So hopefully I can convince you as you go through. But what HP taught me is that as, as human beings, we tend to focus more on features when we're trying to sell something to somebody or convince somebody to do something. So we say, you know, this laser printer will do eight pages a minute, or, you know, the color is this or that. And turns out people don't really care about features. What people care about are benefits. And the way you tell a difference between a feature and a benefit is by asking, so what? So the, the laser jet prints eight pages a minute. So what? I don't care if it prints eight pages a minute or not. That's the feature. The benefit is you get done with your printing a lot quicker and you can get on with something that's more important. Oh, I can see how that's a value. So now Paul has been spending the last first four chapters talking about features. This is, you know, atonement, propitiation, expiation, all that stuff. And now he's got to say, so what? And that's what chapter 5 is about. It's the big so what. It's the benefits of being justified in Christ. The, the solution in chapter 3 is you're justified by the atoning sacrifice of Christ. I think I got all the buzzwords in there. So, so what? Now, if we, if we look at chapter 5, uh, he gives us the therefore. And then he reminds his audience what he's been talking about. So chapter 5, verse 1, therefore, having been justified by faith, referring back to chapter 3. Now, Paul doesn't say, okay, everybody, remember what I was talking about in chapter 3. The people were used to picking up cues like this, and they went, okay, your, your digression about the law is done, and you're going to get back to talking about what you were talking about before the law interrupted us. So the, the main point is, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I could stop right there. That's all we need to know. But Paul is going to spend this, the next 11 verses teasing things out of that to say, okay, well, so what does that mean? And he's going to give us a long list. And I'm, just, I'm going to read the list to you, uh, and I'm going to hit most of them as we go through, but I, I don't promise to hit them all. So these are the benefits of being justified in Christ through faith. 
We have peace with God. And that, again, Paul's talking from an Old Testament uh, uh, context. So when he says peace, he uses a Greek word for it because he's talking to a Greek art, a Greek speaking or reading audience. But what he's really talking about is shalom. So if you think about anything in the Old Testament associated with shalom, that's what Paul's talking about. One of the benefits is the grace of God. One of the benefits is the hope of the glory of God. And I'll talk a little bit when we get there about worldly hope versus Christian hope. One of the benefits is really strange. It's called tribulation. Now, it's I don't know about you, but I do not necessarily see tribulation as a benefit. But Paul is, is, is going to warn us it's coming, and it really is a benefit, and he kind of explains why. And he will talk more about that as, as he goes through Romans. We get the love of God, incredibly important. We get the Holy Spirit. We get the presence of God inside us. All right? It can't get any closer to God than God being inside you. So that's one of the benefits. We get justification. We kind of talked about that last week. We get saved from God's wrath. Remember, Paul started this. He's kind of reminding everybody back to chapter 1 that, that everybody is subject to God's wrath and that God's wrath has <clears throat> excuse me, an immediate uh, immediate implications, so like in this world, and we talked about all the depravity people slip into, but it has eternal implications too of what happens to us after we died. And what Paul is saying is through Jesus Christ, we have moved from the wrath of God to the love of God, and it's an entirely different existence. So whatever we were subject to before, we are no longer subject to. <clears throat> Then he's also going to talk about reconciliation and the implications of that. So he goes through this just very quickly, but he goes through this list all in chapter 5. So we talked about the therefore. Uh, we talked about coming back, and we have peace. So I, I, I spent a lot of time this week thinking about the peace of God and what that really means. And I... I Again, remind that we started off under God's wrath. So it, peace is much better than wrath. God is no longer mad at us. We no longer have a debt with God. However that works out, whatever that separated us from God no longer exists. I, I just It's hard for me to wrap my mind around that. But nothing separates me right now from God. In fact, if, if we read Ephesians 2, it says in some way, I don't understand, we are already seated with him in the heavenlies. So we're up there with God. We just haven't graduated yet to, to that being our perception, but we are already there. Uh, Hebrews says we can approach, the book of Hebrews says we can approach God with confidence because we are in a relationship with him. We have peace with God. And last week we talked about the difference between Isaiah's throne room experience with God and John's throne room experience with God in the book of Revelation. Isaiah is scared to death because he knows he's an unclean person. John is kind of comfortable up in heaven. He's looking around. He's writing notes about the cherubim and stuff like that. He is comfortable in the presence of God because he knows he can be there. Now, I think we have to be careful here. We can approach God with confidence. We can't approach God with arrogance. We always approach God with humility, knowing that it's his will, not ours. And we can't, um, uh, I don't know what the right word is, depend on God's mercy too much. I always think about the story of Ananias and Sapphira, who said, well, God will forgive me. Well, God, yeah, he, maybe he will forgive you, but he might strike you dead before he forgives you. So there, there are earthly consequences we always have to worry about. But God has forgiven us. Okay. Now, we have peace with God. That does not necessarily mean we have peace with the world. In fact, I would argue that having peace with God means you're going to be in conflict with the world. And I'm in pretty good shape there because Jesus said the same thing. If Jesus says it, that settles it. Doesn't matter whether I believe it or not, that settles it. So there's going to be conflict. Uh, just if you look at the disciples, if you look at the martyrs in the early church, if you look today um, where the church is growing the most, it is under tribulation from the world. It's also no guarantee of comfort. Again, Jesus, Paul, Peter, none of them retired to a nice house on the Mediterranean with a swimming pool and, and all that stuff. They did not experience comfort in their lives. And we should not ex uh, expect to experience that either. If we get comfort, if we get nice things, we should rejoice in it, but we should always be aware that if, if we are doing God's work in the world, we will have tribulation. So peace with God, but not necessarily peace with the world. We have shalom. We have rest. 
In the Old Testament, God promised them uh, a covenant. He promised them land. He promised them the law. He promised them the temple. And that was all part of this shalom, the ability to worship God and be with one another in freedom. That's what he promised them, and that's what Jesus is bringing us today. Um, with, with the tabernacle in the Old Testament, the tabernacle moved around with the people, so God could be in the middle of his people regardless of where they were. Now, today we no longer have a tabernacle, we no longer have a temple, although you know the, the foundation of the temple is still there, as you saw in the picture, but we don't need it because we have God inside us. So we are today the literal presence of God in the world. And I'm going to talk some more about that as, as we get to it. We have a relationship with God. If, if we are at shalom with God, we have unlimited contact with God. We can call God anytime we want to and talk to him for as long as we want to. Now, I would also argue that we need to listen to him. And probably we ought to listen more than we talk because I'm pretty sure he already knows what we're going to say. And most of the time, I don't know what he's going to say. So there's, there's benefit in listening to God, but we can go to him any time. We don't have to schedule an appointment. We have comfort from God. Yes, we're going to get tribulation uh, in the world, but we have comfort. We have the peace of God, which uh, Philippians says, you know, surpasses all human understanding. But it's even better than that. We don't not only have the comfort of God, we have the comforter of God. One of the words for the Holy Spirit in the book of John is comforter or assistant or our legal representative or something like that. We have God himself in us. And that, that's to give us direction, that's to give us guidance, and that's to give us transformation. That's part of the sanctification process that Paul's going to be talking about later on. Now, again, deacons in the back row are going, well, Paul, if we have God inside us, how come we keep sinning? And Paul's going to go, yeah, yeah, I knew you were going to ask that. Hang on for a chapter or two. I'm going to deal with that. So not going to talk about that now. But remember, Paul is going to address that. Okay. We have Jesus as Lord. And I think this is important, and we often forget this. Everyone is very, very comfortable with having Jesus Christ. And, and really, it, the title probably, or the name probably should be translated, Jesus the Christ. Christ is not Jesus' last name. It's not what Mary called Jesus when she got mad at him when he was a little boy. Um, it's a title. Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. Uh, again, translating from the Hebrew, the anointed one of God. There are lots of messiahs running around in the Old Testament. David was a messiah. Uh, Moses was a messiah. Cyrus, a pagan, was a messiah. They just meant they were anointed for God's purpose. But Jesus is the messiah. And, and, and we need to, when we see those words together, Jesus Christ, we really ought to read it, Jesus the Christ. But even more important in this passage, I think, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, again, I, I am very, very comfortable with Jesus being my Savior. I, I, I love that I'm saved. It's good to be saved. Everybody wants to be saved from something. The catch is that Jesus can't just be your Savior. He has to be your Lord and Savior. That's a big difference. If Jesus is your Lord, you are his slave. Okay? You do what Jesus or God, same thing in the Trinity, whatever they want you to do. You don't do what you want to do. You do what God wants you to do. And I, I think it's important, Paul is going to talk about this later on, is human beings always have a master. There is never freedom from slavery in the human condition. We are born in slavery to Satan. It's that whole idea of original sin. And God has redeemed us, paid the price for us through Jesus to, to remove us from the bondage to Satan. It does not remove us to freedom. God has bought us. We belong to God now. And I know I'm using the metaphors pretty loosely here, but, but I hope you kind of follow me. We are slaves to God. Paul makes this very clear in, in, in his letters. We are not free to act as we want to. We have just changed masters. So if we want to accept Jesus as our Savior, we also have to accept him as our Lord and Master. Now, I would argue that Jesus as a Lord and Master is much better than the world or Satan as the Lord and Master. One leads to death, one leads to eternal life. So if we want to be right with God, it's got to be Lord and Savior. And this, this, it kind of brings me to Philippians 4, 7, that passage we were talking about, where, you know, the peace of God uh, that surpasses all understanding, 
everybody knows that and they go, okay, I want the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. But what it says is God will guard your heart and mind. Does not say God will make you happy, does not say that God will make you comfortable. It says the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and mind. And I think, this is just my opinion here, what it will guard you from is worry from Satan. Okay. Now there's a difference between worry and concern, and if we ever do Philippians, we can talk a lot more about that. But Satan wants us worried. Worry paralyzes us, worry scares us, worry stops us from trusting God. And if we really participate, if we fully receive the peace of God, God will guard our hearts and minds from that attack of Satan. And I, and I think that's, that's kind of what's going on here. All right. Second big thing we get is an introduction to the grace of God. It, it bothered me for a while. Why do I have to be introduced to God? And then, then it, it hit me. And it, it, it was, I think, maybe after my second cup of caffeinated coffee or whatever. But it hit me. Uh, when you talk about introductions, now I'm going to look. I'm going to quit looking at you, and I'm going to look down at the screen here so I can see all y'all. Um, think back into your history, and if you were ever a teenager, uh, male or female, did you have to be introduced to your girlfriend's father, or did you have to introduce your boyfriend to your girlfriend's father? Was that kind of an uncomfortable position? Or if you were a parent, and your daughter brings in this, you know no good two-bit bum, in your opinion, to introduce you to him, you're kind of like one of those Jews in the back row going, ah, son, you're going to date my daughter? Did, did any of y'all have either any of those experiences? <laughs> Nobody's raising their hands. All right, but you, 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 you're kind of with me on that. Uncomfortable situation. You're, you're being recommended by the daughter. If, if I'm the person being introduced, the daughter, Emma, is re introducing me to her father and saying, you know, uh, Dad, this is a really good guy. Uh, I, I want you to meet him. And Dad's going, I don't think so. I, you know, his sideburns are too long. He looks like he's going to grow a beard in the future. I'm not sure I want him with my daughter. And, and that's the image. Jesus is introducing us to God. And he's saying, God, this guy might not look like much, but I'm covering him. Okay? And that gets us into the grace of God. I can't get into the grace of God. It doesn't matter what I do. I can't earn my way into the grace of God. But Jesus can cover me and then introduce me to God, and God will go, well, Jesus, I don't know about John, but if you say he's okay... If you're covering for him, then it's okay with me, and I will accept him into my grace. Okay, And, and one of the ways I, I kind of, I don't know if this is a good image or not, but y'all ever put on colored glasses, like red glasses or blue glasses? or You can kind of imagine, if you put on glue, blue glasses, what color is everything going to be? Blue. And my sort of image is that God sees me through Jesus' colored glasses. So when he looks at me, he doesn't see my sin, he sees Jesus. He doesn't see all the sins I've kept, committed, all the sins I will commit, he sees Jesus. And because of that, I get his grace. Okay? Can't do anything about it. Um, Paul makes the point that even when we were sinners, God loved us. And I think this is an important point. I don't have to get right with God to be saved. Let me say that again. I don't have to get right with God to be saved. God loved me even when I was the nastiest, filthiest sinner ever possible. And he loved me enough to send his son to die for me. Now, it's, again, it's hard for me to wrap my mind around that. But that ought to give me some sort of sense of comfort. And God loves us now just the way we are. Now, I know God looks down at me and goes, John, I, I made you that way, but man, sometimes you surprise me even so. But God loves me. There is nothing, I, here's, I'm preaching now. I, Steve, you can take up a collection PayPal. But, I, but God loves me just the way I am. I don't need to change anything for God to love me. I don't need to work for his love. I don't need to work for his approval. I don't need to do anything. I can just, I can read, God loves me. You know, now that doesn't mean I'm done. God is still transforming me, but the way God transforms me is is I, Paul's going to talk about later. I've got the Holy Spirit inside of me, 
And my job is not to do anything first. My job is to be with God, abide with God. And if I do that, I am convinced that the fruit of the Spirit, that my actions will automatically come from that being. When I try to do stuff with ignoring the being, then I get into trouble. But if I will be with God, God will give me things to do. Again, Ephesians says God has a to-do list for me that he's just waiting for me to be saved to, to get started on. So I, I think sometimes we think if I just do enough, God will love me or love me more or things will get better. I, I, I am convinced that is the wrong attitude. You love God, you be with God, and then God will handle the doing. Now, if you love God and be with God, there will be doing. If there's no doing, you, you, you're missing something along the way. So if, if, you, if you don't have acts, there's probably no faith, and, and James talks about that too. So we can't earn God. We are helpless to earn God's love, but we get his grace as a free gift. Now, we have hope. Uh, and, and again, this is there's worldly hope, and there is uh, Christian hope. And I, you know, in this coronavirus time, Emma and I are, I spent a lot of money on Amazon. Now, I, I, we're being kind of careful. We're not buying anything that we normally wouldn't buy. But, you know, we need, we ran out of pepper. So we ordered a big Amazon-sized thing of pepper the other day so we wouldn't have to go to the grocery store. And Amazon is real good. They say, you know, your package will be delivered Thursday or something like that. So from a worldly perspective, I hope that package is going to be here on Thursday. It might get here on Wednesday, might not get here on Friday, might get lost. I'm, somebody might go, oh, this can of pepper, I can use that and steal it. But I'm hoping that it will get here on Thursday. Don't know that it will, but I'm hoping that it will. And most times it gets here on Thursday and everybody's happy. That's earthly hope. Godly hope is looking forward to something with the full assurance that it will happen. Okay? So I am hoping in my resurrection. I'm hoping in the second coming. It doesn't mean it may happen or it may not. It means I am looking forward to it with the, uh, the sure expectation that it will happen. So I can hope in a Christian fashion for dawn tomorrow morning. I know it's going to happen. It's happened since the beginning of time or at least the beginning of the earth and the sun, and it's going to happen tomorrow. I know it's going to happen, so if it's 3 a.m. and I'm having a bad night, I can hope for dawn because things are always better at dawn. That's kind of the Christian hope that we're looking for, that, that we're talking about here. It's not may happen or may not. It will happen. We just haven't seen it happen yet. And what we have the hope in is the glory of God. And I, I, I don't know, what again, what that means. But it is the, the, the image of God, the, the presence of God, uh, the Shekinah glory is what they talk about in the Old Testament. The, the, the literal presence of God that is just so glorious we can't experience it. Okay? Now, we don't have that yet. I, I can't you know, go out and see the exact representation of God in the world. Jesus came to introduce the kingdom. He announced the, the, the inauguration of the kingdom. And the, the theological buzzword here is already not yet. So the kingdom of God, the glory of God is already here. It came here with the presence of Jesus, but it's not yet here fully and won't be until Jesus comes back the second time and really implements the kingdom of God. And again, if you, if you read the book of Revelation, I think it's chapter 20, the new kingdom of God will be in a new heaven and a new earth, a new creation. So when that comes back, we will get all the benefits. But right now, we don't have all the benefits of the kingdom of God. And you think about the, the Lord's Prayer. Uh, your, uh, it, it's God's heavenly kingdom here on earth. You know, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So whatever happens up in heaven in your new kingdom, that's going to happen on the earth. That's what we're hoping for. Is, is all the things of Satan will be done away with. The pain, the suffering, the death, the blindness, the coronavirus, whatever, it gone. The new creation, God's kingdom, is coming, is going to replace all that with whatever's in heaven will be on earth. And that's our hope. That's something we can look forward to. That's something we can view current tribulation in, in relation to. So, yes, tribulation is bad, but I know something better is coming. I am hoping for that to come. Now, we can also exult in tribulation. Now, I, I don't know about y'all, but I don't particularly want to exult in tribulation. I don't particularly want any tribulation in my life. Be just real fine if there is no tribulation. But God has a better plan. 
right? And God, according to Paul, is going to put things in our life that we're going to see as tribulation. And Paul makes the point that God is not doing that because he's mean. God is doing that to develop our character. God is more concerned with our sanctification than he is with our comfort. And sometimes we will see that process as tribulation. Okay? We don't enjoy it. We're not asking for it. But there is a purpose to it to, to build perseverance, to build character, to bring us to the hope of, of the glory of God. And that is why we have tribulation. Now, I think Satan delights in, in giving us tribulation too. But, but God is never going to do anything to harm us spiritually, harm us and move us away from his image. Satan does that all the time. If God does something to us, it's to bring us closer to his image to develop characteristics that will make us more godlike. And the, the example I, I, I want to use is, I'm going to talk, no, no, no I'm not, I'm, I'm actually going to read Acts 4. If you want to read along with me, go back to Acts 4 and um, Acts 4 verse 29. Let me take a sip of coffee and I'll set the scene. Um, Jesus has been resurrected. He's talked to the apostles. The apostles have started preaching and the apostles have immediately gotten into trouble. They've come before the high priest and the high priest says, Peter, if you don't stop, bad stuff is really going to happen. Paraphrasing here. Now remember, this was a guy uh, six weeks earlier that was afraid to admit who Jesus was in front of a, a slave girl. But now he stands up to the high priest and says, you cannot stop me. I'm going to keep on preaching. And he knows that persecution and tribulation is going to increase. So he does what Jesus told him to do. He goes back, he gets together with everybody, and he prays. Now, I think this is a great example that we can compare what Peter and the disciples did to what we do. If I am undergoing persecution, the very first thing I say is, Oh, Lord, I raise both hands. Oh, Lord, deliver me from this persecution because I'm a spiritual midget. I'm sorry, I'm a spiritual short person. Don't say the N-word. Um, but I want you to see what the apostles do when they're faced with way more tribulation than I've ever had to face. So this is Acts 4, verse 29. They pray to God. Okay, I can pray to God. My prayer is not quite like theirs. Watch what their prayer does. And now, this is Acts 4, verse 29. And now, Lord, take note of their threats and grant that your bondservants may speak your word with all confidence while you extend your hand to heal, and signs and wonders take place through your name of your holy servant Jesus. Let me paraphrase that. They're asking the Lord, watch out, listen now, they're doing bad stuff to us, but give us that we may speak your word with all confidence, that we may see healing and signs and wonders take place through the name of Jesus. Do they ask to be delivered from the tribulation? No. They say, Lord, just help us witness through this tribulation. Let us spread your word, spread your gospel through tribulation. And heal us and give us signs and wonders. That's the kind of prayer we ought to make in our tribulation. Not done yet. Look at the next verse. And when they had prayed, the place where they had been gathered together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. Now, how long does it take to answer a godly prayer? As far as I can tell, about a verse. If you pray for the right thing, I think God will give it to you. And I think a lot of times the reason we don't get what we pray for is we're praying for the wrong thing. And James supports me in that. Okay? This, I think, is our model in tribulation. It's not deliver me from tribulation. It's, Lord, help me to witness in the midst of tribulation. Sometimes when we're undergoing tribulation, it's because we need to learn something. If a God puts a mountain in our path, sometimes it's because we need to learn how to climb that mountain. Because later on in life, we're going to need to teach someone else how to climb that mountain. So I think in... Uh, Preaching's almost over here, but in today's society, we try to escape tribulation so much, we lose sight that sometimes tribulation is for our benefit, even though it's not comfortable. Okay. So I think, to me, Acts 4 is just such a great example of what we should do when we are suffering. It's, it's God knows we're suffering. God wants to help us. God wants to make us more like Him, and God is going to give us everything that He possibly can but we need to endure in that tribulation. We need to persevere. We need to develop character. We need to learn to hope in the glory of God.
Now, reaching over, Steve, take up the collection and send me at least half of it. Maybe. I can afford some sausage biscuits next week. All right, now, the next thing is the, the, the Holy Spirit or the love of God. Okay. So while we were yet sinners, while we were dirty, nasty sinners, God loved us enough to send himself in the person of his son to die for us. And Paul uses that kind of very Jewish how much more argument to say, if, you know, if God loved him, how much more will he love us? If God did it for him, how much more will he do for us? And, of course, the answer is God will do much more for us. Okay? So God gave himself for us. And I, I think it's, it's, we, we see in this passage, we see God, which is a specific word in, in Greek, theos. We see the Lord Jesus Christ, which is a different set of words. And we see the Holy Spirit. So we see a, a kind of a hint of the Trinity here that, that Paul is talking about all three facets of the Trinity. But the love of God is, is what I want to talk about here. So God not only loves us enough to send his son to die for us, to make everything right, he loves us enough to send himself inside us. And I, I think this is an important concept, and Paul is going to develop this. And he developed it in Corinthians. He's going to develop it in Romans. We are the present. We are the temple of God in the world today. Now, if you go back to the first century, and as far as we know, Paul is writing this from Corinth. And there are all kinds of temples of pagan gods in Corinth. And the purpose of a pagan god temple in Corinth or anywhere else in the Roman world is to show the world who that god is. So if you don't know about Poseidon, the god of the sea, you could go to the temple of Poseidon and learn about Poseidon. You could see what he looked like. There'd be a statue. You could see what the character of Poseidon was like. You could see what the benefits were of worshiping Poseidon. You could develop a relationship with anything you needed to do to deal with Poseidon. You could go to that temple because you could see what he looked like. And I think I've told you this before. In Rome, there were several temples to Nero, the emperor at the time. And he would not only have statues of himself in the temple, each day, depending on what he wore, he would dress those statues to match what he had on that day. So if you wanted to see the image of God, Nero, you could go to his temple, and you could see what, you know, if he had a new toga, it would be on that statue. Okay, so that was the way you encountered God in the old world, little g-god. But now we are God's temple. God is inside us. If someone today wants to see the image of God, the character of God, experience the benefits of being with God, they don't go to a temple, they go to a Christian. And my concern is many times we're not doing a good job of being the literal presence of God in the world today. And, and we, ought to, we ought to be encouraged, we ought to be admonished to better demonstrate the image of God. Because I am convinced if we really demonstrated the image of God to the people in the world today, uh, Christianity would explode. And, and I think one of the reasons we don't is because we don't have the, the apostles' attitude in Acts. Is it that we're trying to escape tribulation rather than witnessing in the, in the face of tribulation. Now, again, old Jews in the back, those Jewish deacons are going, oh, 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 wait, Paul, Paul, got a question. Let me understand this. We got God inside us. God is perfect. God is sinless. If God really is inside us, how come we still sin? And Paul goes, yeah, I know, and I'm going to get to that in a chapter or two. So hang on to that. We'll deal with that later. The quick answer is that we still have the old body, that old sinful body that is is around the image of God. So as long as we have the image of God in us and the old body, we're going to be in conflict. And that's why the resurrection is so important. In the resurrection, we get a body that matches the image of God inside us. So I just, I paraphrased Paul, but remember that argument will come up again in the future. Oh, all right. So what? Paul has gone on for 11 verses. So what? I think one of the big so what's, and this is, thank you, Jesus, that this is true, we don't have to get right with God to be accepted by God. We don't have to get better or good enough for God to accept us. We never can. We are helpless in our own salvation. The only reason we're saved is because God has reached out to us and uh, God, God died for us in the atoning sacrifice of Jesus. He loved us even while we were sinners. Now, the implication of this is, again, like I talked about, is God love, as weird as I am, God loves me right now. And as weird as y'all are, 
God loves you right now. If God has made you the way you are, it is because he has something for you to do with your weirdness. Okay? I, I, I think God has called me to teach. I hope he has. And, and I think God uses all those strangeness that is me to teach effectively. And I'm not going to try to do other stuff. God has not called me to preach. Anytime I try to preach, I don't do well. So I try to do what God has called me to do and uh, be the way I am. And, you know, somebody was joking before. That's just the, the way they are. That's, this is just the way I am. I just what, what you all see here is, is whatever comes out of my mouth is what God wants me to, I hope. And, and that's just it. I trust God that he is using however weird I am to effectively talk to people. And I, I think we need to just rest and relax. Don't try to earn God's love because we've already got we've got as much of God's love as we possibly can get. Now again, doesn't mean we don't get better, doesn't mean we don't become more like God, but we do that by being with him. And and the the example I always use, don't know if it's a good one or not, is an apple tree. Does an apple tree have to work hard at growing apples or does an apple tree if they, you know, drinks the water and gets the nutrients from the roots just naturally produces apples. And and that's that's my image. If I drink deep of the moisture of God, if I get the nutrients of the Word of God, if I really experience the, the Holy Spirit inside me, I am automatically going to produce fruit. Don't have to worry about it. It will happen automatically. And I will produce the right kind of fruit. I have never seen an apple tree produce oranges. Okay? So if I abide, that will happen automatically. Now, we also have to have faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Not just our Savior Jesus Christ, but our Lord. We have to remember we are slaves to God. We don't live our lives for ourselves. We live our lives for God. So what? Okay. So what is we should endure in tribulation? Don't want to do it. It's not comfortable to do it. And I think the catch here is very often tribulation, we don't, we don't see it as tribulation. We see it as aggravation. Okay? I don't want to get up to do a Sunday school lesson. It's tribulation for me to have to wake up early in the morning and do a Sunday school lesson. Well, is it good for me? Yeah. Will it make me a better person and more godlike? Yeah. And God is going to kick me out of bed to do that. And while I may not like that, that is something that I should rejoice in and understand that it's for my good. I, some of y'all that have heard my whole moving from Hewlett Packard to seminary story, it involved a Bible study that started at, I don't know, it, at the time I considered it an ungodly time. It was probably about six in the morning or something like that. I, and that was tribulation, but it became an important part of my journey from Hewlett Packard to, to full-time seminary. So don't be confused if tribulation is small God starts us, at least he starts me small and then helps me uh, gain experience and get better and better. So it, tribulation is not necessarily going to be life-threatening for us. I, I pray that it isn't, but it might be the little small things that we, we miss. Now, corollary to that, I almost feel like Paul. Well, if that's true, then this. And I've mentioned this before. If you're not experiencing tribulation, something may be wrong. Because the world is not happy with Christians, Satan is not happy with Christians, and if, if you're moving against Satan, he will move against you. If, if Satan is not moving against you, you have to start questioning, am I going in the right direction, or am I just going with the flow and, and letting Satan take me along? So, don't know, just be careful about that. Lots of tribulation in the world. I, think, I don't think the coronavirus is a, a punishment from God. I, I see all kind of weird things on the internet that they're blaming everybody for it. But, but it is a tribulation from Satan's world. And our tendency is to worry about it. We know people, we have relatives that, that are in life-threatening situations for it. And we have to remember that God is surrounding us. That from our perspective, it may not make sense, but the, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard our hearts and minds. That will guard us from worry if we just trust in God and, and hope for his glory. Final thing, is, well, not, not the final, any time a preacher says the final thing, there are at least two more things to go. But the next to final thing is relaxation. And I, I, I see so many Christians that are wearing themselves out with work because they, not that there's anything the matter with work, but they're working because they think they can earn God's love or they can earn more of God's love or they can prove that they're better Christians by doing things. 
And it's a mistake we can all fall into. Relax in the gospel. The good news is that God loves us. He loves us enough that while we were sinners, he died for us and took care of all the problems that exist between us and him. We are at peace with God. We, just relax. Okay? God will tell you what to do. God will cause you what to do if you just abide in him. The Holy, the Holy Spirit is in us. The Holy Spirit will guide us if we listen. It's all that back to that contact thing, that prayer thing, that listening to God. Final thing, and this really is the final thing, is sanctification. God will cause us to be changed to be more like him. So that's jumping ahead several chapters, and, uh, and we'll save that for a, a couple of weeks from now. Okay.